back to Indian Omics. Professor Raghuram Rajan was at his academic best last week when he spoke about the role of debt through history and the dilemmas of regulating too much and too little debt. Here are slices of that very interesting speech given in Presidency College, Kolkata. Debt is very much like dynamite. It's an instrument which is very useful in the right places, explosive in others. There is always a temptation to overuse it because it's so easy to use and sometimes very warped incentives to use it. However, despite these difficulties associated with debt, banning debt is typically not an option. The right answer typically is can we get moderation? And for a regulator like me, can I regulate moderation even in the face of very strong political economy reasons to throw caution to the wind. Uh, massive clamor to reduce interest rates, to ease capital requirements, to uh, facilitate lending in a very big way uh, in good times, only for society to pay the price in bad times. And the real question is, can we moderate uh, the, the pressure in the good times, do only so much of it as is necessary so that we don't face terrible times. A thousand years ago, uh, money lenders, uh, they were called usurers in the, in the West, uh, were people who were hated, um, and some would say they're still hated around the world. Uh, today they're called bankers. But uh, uh, this is a uh, this is something that, is, uh, that has been there through much of history. Um, sermons of church, uh, um, of priests, a um, thousand years ago in, in, uh, in, in Europe, were full of horror stories about how God's judgment would fall on unrepentant lenders. Typically, in more primitive societies without an enforcement structure, what you really have is favors. I do a favor for you, and following a broad norm of reciprocity, you keep that in mind as a debt you owe me, and you repay the favor sometime down the line by doing a favor for me. Right? So somebody in, in a village who has a, a harvest of, uh, of say, uh, lady singers, will take some of the excess and spread it around, give other people. And those people, when they have their harvest of apples or have, they have their harvest of pumpkins, will give back some of those. But this kind of favor, mutual favor, uh, is a way of building social bonds. And over time is a source of social insurance also. When you run short and you have nothing to give, still the village may look after you and, uh, and repay some of these favors. What this debt does is make all this very explicit. It says, I will repay you thus and such amount at thus and such date, and if I don't repay you, you have some power over me. You can seize some assets, you can put me in jail. In the days there were debtors' prisons. Uh, basically, you can find forcible ways of getting it back. And these things are typically enforced by an external party. So one of the uh, uh, benefits of debt is it's a clear obligation, it's not fuzzy. And it is enforceable, so I don't have to rely on your continued good, goodwill. I can be as nasty as I want towards you, you still have to repay the debt. Now one of the advantages of debt that has been extolled in recent uh, literature is because it's such a hard security, because often it is short term, sometimes it's runnable. It means I don't need to know very much about you, I don't need to trust you very much. I don't need to know very much about you because no matter how well your, or badly your business does, because I'm secured by, for example, the land that your business stands on, I can get repayment. I don't have to know what your business is, I don't even have to have any faith in you as an entrepreneur. Right? So, the value of debt is that we can be really distant from each other, both in information 
as well as in social terms and debt still flows between I give it you up front, you have the resources to conduct your business, you repay me at the, uh, at the end. And typically you find that in many communities, the lender, the creditor, the Shylock comes from outside the community. Because that's the only way they can have the dispassionate ability to recover, regardless of the situation of the borrower. And it is that ability to recover under any circumstance that in fact allows them to lend up front. And this is something that people sometimes don't understand fully in India, right? Uh, that by making it hard for somebody to recover, we make it harder for somebody to lend in the first place. That enforcement of debt is necessary to get the lending in the first place. If you think that lending is good, we should be willing to enforce that contract. We have it in our regulations, for example. Sometimes we say you cannot take collateral against this loan. If we say you cannot take collateral, the incentive for the bank to lend is so much lower because it's not sure to get repaid. It has no ability to enforce the repayment. So by saying you can't take collateral, we feel we are doing the borrower a favor. Yes. We're doing a favor to those who can get loans. But those who can get loans are far fewer than those who could get loans if we allowed collateral. The good thing about the debt contract is it works in transferring resources to those in need. And it can transfer, the more anonymous uh, the, the money lender is from me, the more liquid the contract is in, is in his hands because his ability to exercise power of me can be transferred to some other person. If you think about corporations, corporations can borrow over a long period, pledging a lot of value. They can borrow 30, year, 30 years against a power plant today, This is or 25 years in the 525 rule uh, that we have here today, because the power plant is going to generate revenues over 25 years, it has a debt contract, it has to repay the lender, and that allows it to borrow really long term beyond the lives of anybody running the plant. More recently, a big, a big factor against debt has been what we call moral hazard. And the reason here is that because debt is such a senior contract, because I don't have to think twice before lending, I'm willing to lend into situations where it doesn't make sense to lend. When the borrower is over borrowing, is borrowing too much from many borrowers. We all think we'll get our money back. Eventually, some of us won't. But we also hope that because we're all over lending, either the government or the IMF or somebody else will come in and bail us out. So we lend to excess. The big criticism against debt in the church canon, as well as in Islam today, is that because it's such a hard contract, the lender really doesn't take any risk. The lender is not participating in the enterprise, essentially extracts his pound of flesh without putting anything at stake except his money. And the borrower takes all the risk because the borrower, if the enterprise fails, essentially loses everything while the debtor goes away whole. This is the criticism against debt, which is why Islam often requires sharing. Uh, Interest-bearing uh, contracts are prohibited in Islam, while sharing contracts are much, much praised. But first, if you look at this carefully, uh, certainly equity-like contracts may be uh, better from the sense of sharing the risk, but they may be harder to write, because when you write a uh, sharing contract, you have to know what the other fellow is doing. You have to know his business. You have to trust him. You have to trust him to run his business. The anonymity which is embedded in debt is no longer there, which then brings in all the disadvantages. You have to have much more information. You have to have much more trust. And it is very hard for uh, really arm's length outsiders to come and lend. Essential to what debt does is the hardness of the debt contract. And the harder the debt contract is, the more you can borrow. There's a lot of talk going on amongst academics that, you know, this whole uh, 
uh, leverage in the banks was not particularly useful. And I agree that 50 to 1 leverage in some of the banks was simply too much. But at the same time, they go to the opposite extreme and say there's no advantage to debt. We could have banks that are fully equity funded. And I would argue that is complete nonsense. That you cannot get banks that are fully equity funded and have the kinds of costs of finance that you could have with banks that have substantial leverage. That's why we have banks with you know, uh, 10, 12 times the amount of debt uh, relative to equity. That's a reasonable leverage ratio. That's what we have in India. But I think that level of debt is necessary in order to give the borrower cheap finance. Thanks for watching. Next week, we may have seen what we haven't seen for the last 10 years, a rate hike from the U.S. Federal Reserve.